the session is called Development Pathways in Network Circuits, Disruption or Assimilation. Uh, it's indeed an honor uh, to have all of you here uh, with us and uh, it's a kind of high point for IT for Change to have had the privilege uh, along with IDRC to host this event. Um, I'm also extremely privileged to uh, speak in this uh, panel. Thank you very much uh, to my colleagues. Uh, what I will do is read out for about 12 to 13 minutes, more 13 than 12, <laughs> um, so that I don't trip over my thoughts and I'm able to represent the work of my organization, the conversations and the writings of my colleagues uh, and do justice uh, to that. So our paper is called Network Models and, and Development Ethics, Some Empirical Explorations. And in our essay, a very, very long version of which we have uh, posted on the blog, uh, we wish to bring the spotlight on uh, micro-local environments and practices in the network society, adopting an approach that is socio-material. We do not look for impacts of technology or causality, but scrutinize the network society phenomenon as a social condition. The fact that contemporary social systems are overlapping and intermeshed assemblies in which digital technology and its material and immaterial elements also make up the social experience of being human and the individual experience of belonging. At IT for Change, we've been working now for nearly a decade with collectives of Dalit women, women from the so-called lower castes, and these collectives are locally referred to as sanghas in villages that are about 150 kilometers from the city of Bangalore. The sanghas were set up in the late 1980s through what was then a radical and pioneering program of the government, the Mahila Samakya program. The philosophical foundations of the Mahila Samakya program were Frarian, and the emphasis was on investing public finance in creating the space and time needed for women, mostly illiterate and socially marginalized, to collectively reflect and act upon the conditions of their oppression. Through the 25 years of their existence, Sanghas have seen gradual but decisive shifts. The rise and rise of organized crime and corruption in local politics and a mind-boggling complexity of new networks, net network formations. The MS or the Maila Samakya Sangha is no longer the only public forum for women. There are many, many others. The decentralization of governance through constitutional amendment and the place for women in local government through quotas or reservation has brought many Dalit women into public life, some of whom have been nurtured by the Maila Samakya Sanghas. As the drudgery of life and the unpredictability of jobs continues, Local institutions have become entrenched in non-transparency and expanding webs of clientelism. Caste and kinship are re-articulated through these institutions and mainstream party politics complicate these equations as emerging loyalty groupings transect the public and community sectors. Money for several programs reaches the village governance institution, but getting one's entitlement is an uphill task unless you are an influential part of the system life world intersections, at least to service vote bank politics, if not for other transactions of mutual favor. Non-government organizations and microfinance institutions have set up shop over time, and many Sangha women, many a Sangha woman is a part of multiple forums, self-help groups as they are referred to in government documents and in private sector documents. In the 12th plan period of the central government of India, the Mahila Samakya program's continuity has come under considerable threat as calls for withdrawal from old districts have sent staff and the Sanghas into a tizzy about how to sustain action on the ground and stay alive over time. The rollback of the program has seen an intergenerational loss of institutional integrity of the Sanghas. Our public information center works with entitlement processes building Sangha capacity for using computers, IVRS, community media, GIS, and online website sites and platforms. It's hard work to build a center as a people's institution, to walk the path of participatory process, enabling Sanghas to own and steer the techno-social project. The force of competing forums and networks is strong, and our work does not bring monetary profits. Even so, 
we've managed to set up four village centers and two sub-district hubs. Also, the collective ownership model has had its good moments and the center's activity has birthed new network geographies, noteworthy for strong and transparent civic public, citizen government, citizen go government interrelationships. The community media aspects lend continuity to the citizenship pedagogies and act as the memory of the Sangha's stories of transformation and courage. In the complex and rapidly shifting social institutional milieu in the villages we work in, the greatest threat to Sangha solidarity and institutional integrity comes from another non-profit, the Sri Kshetra Dharmasthala Rural Development Project, doesn't matter, SKDRDP in short, which is a microfinance institution also providing other services. SKDRDP came into Mysore and to the villages we work in in mid-2012. It is a trust promoted by local philanthropist Virendra Hegde, who also heads the famous 700-year-old Dharmasthala Manjunatha temple in the coastal region of Karnataka. Currently covering 20,000 villages, about 4 million women members, and through 300,000 self-help groups in Karnataka, the trust adopts a self-help mode working in addition to microfinance on transfer of agricultural technology, farm mechanization, promotion of hygiene, health, education, watershed development, renewable energy, waste management, insurance, producer cooperatives, etc. Within days of their arrival in 2012, waves of defection by Mahila Samakya Sanghas were reported in the villages we work. The micro practices of Dharmasthala Sanghas are based on religious order. In the meetings, lamps are lit, prayers are chanted, and timeliness demanded of all members. If an individual member of the group defaults on her repayment, penalties are levied on the entire group. Credit discipline is ensconced in religious morality. Public meetings of the organization are held with high visibility and religious pilgrimages promoted with deep fervor. Women are encouraged to relinquish membership in other sanghas and take a public oath for conforming to the religious order. The Dharmasthala Sangha has established itself in the hinterlands of Mysore with astounding rapidity. Their approach to institutional linkages, integrating livelihoods and service provision in health, insurance and finance is clearly very rewarding for the poor who can expect little from public institutions. The social power of SKDRDP is tremendous. It is a banking correspondent in the financial inclusion plan of the Government of India. Its funding networks penetrate state institutions that have consistently rooted money through the Trust for Development projects. It is patronized by politicians of the state and the center. The Trust's bona fides, however, are highly contested by people's rights movements in the local region that have demanded high-level inquiry and legal action around alleged irregularities with regard to ownership of 1,300 acres of land by the promoter of the Trust, Virendra Hegde. Hegde stakes in the temple, which earns around rupees 600 crores every year. I don't know what that translates into in US dollars, but it's a lot of money. From public donations have been brought to question, and movement activists have urged that the temple be brought into state regulation. The rural countryside today is replete with sanghas and self-help groups owing, owing allegiance to various origins. Government schemes, NGO projects, micro savings activity, private MFIs, microfinance institutions, etc. Every Sangha signifies for the poor woman an opportunity to negotiate the hardships of her life, to search for a modicum of dignity and hope. As our work on community informatics continues in partnership with the Sangha, the domestication of women and their instrumentalization by big society actors reveals how the development process itself centralizes control over the marginalized poor. It is not as if women have a natural proclivity any more than men for group finance. But there's no real alternative. Markets have al always been arenas for the expression of forms of social authority and status derived from outside the economy. Patriarchal and divine authority, as in the case of SKDRDP, are unfailing tools to supply the preconditions for competition, information, skilling, contracts, access to finance, etc., to poor women laying the foundation of apparently secular but ruthlessly cooperatist regulative institutions that divide struggles with a shared history. In an overall environment where identity politics is mainstream and visceral, marginalized women's organizations are inevitably drawn into its web, 
the gradual and often invisible loss of critical public space leaves political movements devitalized and atomized. In the emerging post-microfinance era, we see big players adopting a hold-all approach, catering to multiple needs, segmenting society into differentiated markets at the bottom of the pyramid, BOP. Some MFIs, microfinance institutions, believe that the sector's future depends on big data for effective targeting of differentiated products. Mobile communication giants are also looking at entering the space, bringing with them their own variety of platforms and solutions. And the unique ID project of the government is seen to be an opportunity to leverage information across MFIs on individual transactions. As bankability becomes vital for the survival of capital, MISO institutions balancing commercial sustainability and social considerations can work only by selective inclusion. The poorest may not qualify as worthy customers. Traditional NGOs are also very sought after, more and more as value co-creators who can join forces on a common endeavor, a cause with a win-win business solution for BOP markets. Ethical boundaries in these arrangements are highly diffuse as change and development, empowerment and participation become ingredients of a value chain with a colorful variety of actors that subsumes the consumer at the bottom of the pyramid, bound by a warm and fuzzy web of cooperation. Emerging trends behoove us to look closer at the politics of representation and the ethics of change making. Apolitical intermediaries, intermediaries whose business is to mop up the political labor of other civil society actors are a breed whose locus standi needs interrogation. They occupy nodes in networks of change. They control resource and information flows and they portend the triumph of a democratic centralization that invariably engulfs its peripheries. As contemporary capitalism, transposes development into commodity markets, driving fissures into community and political collectivity, it simultaneously pushes for the deinstitutionalization of that which does not fit into straitjacket exchange theory of value in a network of perish dictum. The Myla Samakya Sanghas we work with still keep up their practice of getting together, creating and listening to radio programs, and keeping information exchange decommoditized. They have, through our translocal collaborations that Desiree mentioned yesterday with communities from other countries, been able to connect to shared global struggles for public access and meaningful connectivity, which, by the way, does not exclude entertainment, but need not be the cunningly homogenous or homogeneously cunning mishmash of Hollywood and Bollywood that we see in India, for instance. But it is a challenge to stay with and sustain the elements of permanence that allow the collective to learn, act, and reflect. For the Sanghas, connection, conviviality, and conscientization are rooted in an analysis of material and social power. The collective agency to reclaim both is a commitment to time and shared history. The incursions of big society networks into the Sangha space dislodges collective memory about another ethics of knowing, being, and doing. So, what does this have to do with the continuities of exclusion? What we witness in network society capitalism is the futility of playing catch up. As Piketty's bestseller, recent bestseller, seller, Capital in this 21st Century, which I've been recommended to read, I have not yet read it, but the reviews that I've seen, seem to suggest that wealth today grows more quickly than does the economy as a whole. The relative losers are no longer low earners, but rather anyone who is not a capitalist. The post-local global class today consolidates its power by controlling the meso spaces of the network. Meanwhile, the digital underclass, celebrated in many an ICTD research for their creativity and resilience, you know, expressions I just have come to hate, live connected lives that have little bearing on their capability to shape new network destinies. As the marketization of connectivity extends on a planetary scale, proliferating access is gulped down by the platform business. Not only disembedded internet intermediaries that we know, but new ones in town, aggregators who use embedded markets and their means of production for a brand new local relations of production. 
Human interaction and cooperation in virtual space, meanwhile, is a site for expropriation. Information, knowledge, expression, and exchange are monetized as participatory culture transmutates into labor in the capitalist enclosures of network society. Knowledge is disembedded and locked in copyright regimes. It is then centralized and re-embedded through distributed networks as universal commodities of ubiquitous connectivity. Even Wikipedia is not exempt from this. Social power in the network society is about a global nexus of clientelism and dependency exercised through sites of network governance. A remarkably flexible innovation akin in its professed non-dogma to its rather staid and archaic political cousin, Anaki. Network governance allows big systems to secure their material semiotic power through co-option. It presents small systems with a with us or against us, fait accompli. Network governance honors creativity and loathes downtime for human process. It abstracts human vulnerability into a wicked problem, advocating that it be solved by swarms of small, loosely networked social entrepreneurs. It makes the ancient bulwarks of the civic and global order seem like they have got it all wrong for being public and non-profit. Network governance confers upon big systems the right to own and exploit data consol to consolidate power. As the social contract gives way to network membership, citizenship becomes a phantom of the past. The global class does not have use for it, and the rest can grasp it no more in the ever-shifting formations of network power. So what about new imaginaries of networks and of society? A seamless subsumption of human labor and sentiment, nature and land, public governance and common cultures into the insatiable appetite of capital on the one hand, and the collective loss of moral will to bring justice for the most marginalized on the other, characterize social condition in the network society, co-constituted by time-space compression. A new ethics of time and space, therefore, is an important starting point for transformative change. This would entail reorganizing socio-materiality around places of flows, however indeterminate such places may be. It would also require a new ethics of memory that honors nature and culture as a priori and not the commodity fictions they have been reduced to. The nomadic nexus of networks and their hierarchical reality cannot be countered by an overemphasis on exploits and hacking. It requires that we return to the class question and seek a new ethics of materiality, pertaining but not limited to the distribution of pipes, machines, towers, gadgets, internet spectrum, and the particular socialities that are produced. It also calls for recovering the immaterial from discourses of commodity. The digital divide that we talked about yesterday is perhaps a useful heuristic. Only its metaphors should vividly capture the hierarchy of networks, hierarchies transacting life worlds and systems where some have the luxury to be part of a global habitus that lays down the syntax of a global culture. Bridging this calls for a new ethics of truth, as if embodied realities matter and a search for authenticity where communication is not for the sake of communication. Here, the possibility that we can use big data for a different world does not hinge on its power to deconstruct multiplicities. It hinges on the ability to identify how singularities and multiplicities need to be ethically related. Finally, there is a need for calling out and critiquing development research that subverts ethnographic explorations to perpetuate epistemology unabashedly devoid of ethics and reason. ICTs and development research cannot be, cannot afford to be, agnostic to the moral philosophical. Thank you.